Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, so right now, I, uh, my current, current job, I work for a equipment manufacturer that, that builds equipment that, that uh, does slurry and microsurfacing. But uh, my previous job before that, for 22 years, I was a, a microservicing contractor that uh, we did work, uh, had about five crews and did work from uh, northern Minnesota down to southern Texas and into New Mexico. So um, I've been around this equipment for almost 25 years, and, and so I look forward to speaking with you all today. So we're going to talk today about a little bit about the operation of a slurry or microservicing paver, types of pavers, spreader boxes. We're going to talk about a little bit about support equipment, but Chuck hit that pretty good. We're going to hit some calibration basics. And then what's, I think, really important about this is once we explain the equipment, I'm going to talk about what do you as an inspector need to look at out there to make sure you're not having problems that are being caused by the equipment. One thing is it, it gets a little confusing as, as we talk slurry pavers. I'll, I'll give you when a, if there's a difference between slurry and micro or, or if there's an equipment difference that you need. So bear with me if I say slurry here and micro here and don't differentiate. I'll try and do a pretty good job of that. So what is a slurry paver? Because we, we've talked about the emulsion, we've talked about the products, we talk about what it does. What does a slurry paver do? Because it's a, it's a little bit more than what a lot of pieces of equipment are. First of all, it's a transport device. It is a truck, whether it's a truck mount paver that we'll talk about or a continuous paver that we talk about. It is a transport device. All the aggregate, the emulsion, the water, the cement, and the additives are all on this vehicle out onto the road and it's paving. What else is it? It's an asphalt plant. It's an asphalt mixer. Now the, the photo is of a hot mix plant and obviously we know we're working with emulsions here but but this slurry paver is a transport vehicle but then once it gets out to the roadway it starts mixing the product. So, so it's a plant as well. It's also a paver. It takes what it transports, it takes what it mixes, and it lays it down on the roadway. And so it has to act as, as a, it has to be able to give a good finish to the road as well. And the last thing it does is, and I, I don't want to confuse you with a picture of a roller, but you notice that's a, that's a small roller. It's a finish roller. So, so again, this paver finishes the final product with, with the spreader box and with the, with the strike offs or the burlap that, that Chuck talked about. So, so as you look at that, we've got one piece of equipment that's really doing four things. And as an inspector, that makes it a little difficult because you're not relying on somebody at the asphalt plant to make sure that that portion's right. And you're not relying on somebody to watch the roller pattern because, because that's being done elsewhere. You have to know what this piece of equipment's doing. You have to understand what it's doing. And you have to know what to look for to make sure that it's producing a good quality product. And so we take all those things and we put it all in in, in one nice package. Um, I'll try this here so, so we don't mess up. So the microservicing paver carries aggregate and a hopper in the middle. It carries emulsion and water in tanks on the side. This is a continuous paver, so it is being fed by support units, and we'll talk about that as we go forward. Uh, here's the spreader box that we talked about, and it, it's all in this package. So that's what, that's what we're look, looking for, and we're going to get deeper into that here as we move forward. So what's important to know as an inspector is, is how's this paver doing? How's it, how does it operate? And one thing you need to think about is, is when Debbie Deep does a mix design for your contractor, she's doing a volumetric mix design. So she's taking a known weight of aggregate, well, excuse me, a known amount of aggregate, but she weighs it. She's taking a percentage of emulsion, She's taking a percentage of water and maybe a percentage of additives. And she's making a batch mix. Well, this is a continuous flow paver. So this machine needs to take a mix design that's based on a batch and figure out how to mix it properly, continuously, never stopping, and, and continue to stay in mix design. So, so we're going to talk a lot about how it does that and a lot about how you can ensure that it's doing it. 
we talk about mixing. So here's where we get into differences between slurry and microservicing. If, if a slurry unit, if a, if a unit is only paving slurry seal, it can use a ribbon mixer. And you'll see a, a picture of that on, on this side here. It's just a very gentle mixing action. It's one single ribbon, and it sits in there and really gently mixes the slurry. And that is fine for a slurry seal. On the other hand, Debbie talked about microsurfacing needs a really high horsepower shearing action mix that really pushes the material. So with a microsurfacing paver, this, this is the mixer. It's slid out for cleaning, but you can see that it's got some very aggressive paddles. There's twin shafted with twin high horsepower, the motors are in the back, driving those. So it's a very different mixing action between slurry and microsurfacing. So this type of mixer can mix both. This type of mixer can only do slurry seal. And there may be, there may be a few of these units working out in your area on slurry jobs. Uh, and you just, need to be, you just need to be aware of that. So we then have, we have two different types of pavers. We have truck mount pavers and we have continuous pavers. So the truck mount paver, if you look at the rear of the truck mount versus the rear end of a continuous paver, they look identical. And that's because they are. They're almost the same configuration on both units at the rear of where it's working. All that is different is the transport mechanism. So with a truck mount paver, very simply, the, the, the paver starts at the stockpile unit, at the stockpile yard, loads with emulsion, water, aggregate, drives out to the project, places the material, and then drives back to the stockpile location, reloads, and just continues and continues and continues to do that. In some places, it's the way to go, in other places not so much. So let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of a truck mount paver. So one of the advantages is flexibility. If a crew has multiple units, they can be working on multiple locations of the project at one time. Or they can be working on mul multiple projects at one time. A truck mount usually takes a smaller crew to operate with the fact that you're, you're not hooking up trucks and you're not moving continuously, you can use three or four less people on a truck mount than you can on a continuous. Advantages also of a truck mount is faster speed in between, either between the stockpile and the job or in between different jobs. It, it's a truck and it moves pretty quick and so that's helpful. Another advantage, but you'll notice I have it with an asterisk, is maneuverability. Some truck mounts are very maneuverable and work well in cul-de-sacs and small areas, but you'll see some videos coming up and some pictures is in order to meet weight li limitations, the contractors have to really stack a bunch of axles underneath them. Once you stack that many axles, you lose some of that maneuverability and a continuous machine is going to turn better than a, than a truck mount will. Some disadvantages are because a truck mount only holds a certain amount of material, um, you're going to get a transverse joint every 1,500 feet or so, depending on your application rate, your paving width, things like that. So on small jobs, on small streets, residential streets, that's not a problem. Out on an interstate highway, you don't really want a transverse joint every 1,500 feet. So the truck mount may not be the best choice for that project. The other disadvantage you could have is, is if they do not stack a bunch of axles under it, a uh, truck mount with tandem axles is going to have some very high axle loading, and it will find out quickly if you prepped your road or not prepped your road correctly because it will find any weak spots in the subgrade. Um, another thing about it, you've got expensive equipment. You've got it's a whole mixer unit, and that expensive unit spends three quarters of its day going back to the stockpile and driving back and back to the stockpile and back. And so to make any money, you've got to have multiple of these more expensive units. The other thing I think is important, especially for quality, is that the operator does not have control of the forward speed. The operator is communicating either by radio or by hand signals with the driver of the truck. And if they're not communicating well, one of two things will happen. One thing may happen is, is if the driver, truck driver is driving too slow, 
the spreader box is going to fill up with material. It's going to start running th through the sides. It's going to start spilling over the top. And you're going to have a lot of screaming and yelling and gnashing of teeth, and it's going to get ugly. If the truck driver, on the other hand, is driving too fast, and the, and the spreader box runs out of material, well, then you're going you're gonna to have a 12-foot wide lane. You're only going to be paying, paving six foot wide until they get it shut down. And again, you're going to have screaming and yelling and gnashing of teeth, and it's not going to be good. So, so that's one issue that I have with, with truck mounts is, is the crew has to be talking to each other. They have to be communicating, or you're going to have a mess. And I, I, I put their maneuverability as a disadvantage as well, and, and I'll show you one here as we go. So you'll see a lot of axles on that truck mount, and as I do pick them up as they, as they while well, they're paving, which is legal, but it still is a longer unit. And, and if you would have watched, they were not able to make that whole cul-de-sac. So, so again, you can see uh, pretty well here. Aggregate in the middle, emulsion and water, and I always forget which side's which. Uh, spreader box, burlap drag, and there's the transport unit there, all in one package. Continuous paver, again, you'll see. The rear of the unit looks almost identical. Um, the continuous paver has a little slightly smaller hopper, so while a truck mount's going to have a 10 or 12 cubic yard hopper, this unit has a 7 cubic yard hopper. All it needs is to store enough material in it so that when, when a truck unhooks and another truck comes back in, it's got some time to keep paving while they get things hooked up. So not a problem there. So we'll watch a continuous pave. So you'll see this crew, this was actually the first day, um, first day of April and the first day the crew had worked all year. So they don't, uh, they're not moving overly fast, but they're moving very well and they're doing a good job. Uh, you'll see uh, with that, there's, there's more people there. You've got a driver. You've got uh, the person on the front that's hooking and unhooking the support units, um, inspectors in the way, um, gentlemen working on the spreader box, and I think we'll see a pretty good shot of the operator coming up here. Operator there is in charge of the forward speed of the unit, plus is making sure that there's enough material going into the spreader box. So with that continuous paver, we've got advantages and disadvantages of what, as well. So some advantages, we've got fewer transverse joints. Um, that crew there had, I believe, six support units. Um, I believe, if I remember right, they went almost two miles without stopping their first day, their first take off the bat. So, so if you can go two miles without a, uh, any transverse joints, that's pretty good. Again, the operator has control of the forward speed, so that helps with your quality. Continuous paver can do more miles in a day. Um, six lane miles is pretty easy normally, sometimes up to eight or ten if a crew's really clicking. So that's a good day's production. You as an inspector need to make sure to know how much your crew can do because you need to be out in front of them knowing, well, is everything prepped ahead of time? Have my crews got everything crack sealed or whoever's crack sealing? Uh, is, is that much road ready to go today? So you don't want to slow up your contractor. Another interesting thing about a comp continuous paver, it has left and right driver stations. Whereas with a truck, you're only driving from the normal side. So, so the reason that that helps quality is, is if the best place to pull off is on the right side of the paver and, and he's got a, he or she has a, a nice edge line to look at, then they can be on that side of the paver. If the best place is, is off the left and that, that's where they need to be looking, they can, they can do either way. And they can jump back and forth as they're paving. So, so that helps with quality as well. Um, we talk about inexpensive with an Asterix haul trucks. Again, the big money machine, the paver, is staying on the road and it continues paving. Uh, the support units, which cost less than a paver, keep moving back and forth and, and they do all the driving and, and so you're not, you don't have money going out the door for, for units just driving around all day.
Another good thing is you have one calibration for job, per job. So if you have three truck mounts on a job, you need to calibrate three units. If you have four truck, tra truck mounts, four units. With a continuous paver, you've only got one, one calibration. Disadvantages is if a paver breaks, you're done. You can't keep going. Uh, travel speed is pretty slow, about uh, 18 miles per hour downhill with a tailwind. So if you've got a job 20 miles apart, it's going to take some time to get there. So a low boy is necessary for most projects. It takes additional crew members and one paver, one job. Okay, in Virginia you may come across two different types of pavers. You may have mechanical paver or an electronic paver. And I want to talk to you about the, the, the differences. They basically act the same, they do the same, but they do it a little differently. So a mechanical or an air over hydraulic paver uses what's called a jack shaft, and I'll show you some pictures as we go forward, uses a jack shaft to power both the emulsion pump and the aggregate belt at the same time. The jack shaft keeps the aggregate belt and the emulsion pump turning at the same time at the same ratio. And so these, then these hydraulic systems are controlled by air operated switches. The electronic paver is electric over hydraulic. It uses computer controlled hydraulic motors to separately power the aggregate belt and emulsion pump. And so a computer is telling the, is, is watching how fast the aggregate belt is spinning. Then it calculates, well, how fast do I need to spin the, the emulsion pump or the water pump or the additive pump to keep everything in ratio. So that computer does all the work for it. Some other differences that mechanical paver has an adjustable aggregate gate, and we'll talk about that as we move forward, that, that controls emulsion content. And I know that's a little strange. I just said that the aggregate gate controls emulsion content. We talk about that as we go forward. And the paver is calibrated using air or electronic counters, which count revolutions. The electronic paver uh, has a fixed aggregate gate, and the emulsion content is controlled by the computer controller. Controller checks and adjusts the speed of the various motors to keep mix ratios constant. So here's the jack shaft. So, so you've got a, you've got a uh, here's a, the emulsion pump. You've got a shaft running through here. Back behind here is a chain that's running the, the, uh, the aggregate belt. So you can see that the emulsion, the aggregate are mechanically timed, tied. So when we spin here, we get a spin of the, of the uh, emulsion pump and a turn of the uh, aggregate belt. And that's what keeps this machine uh, in mixed design. This is just uh, hydraulically driven, all computerized hydraulic motors, turning all the goodies. You also may come across equipment that either has a monitoring system which basically takes the air counters and turns it into computer counts and will give you a printout as an inspector give you a printout at the end of the day. The electronic units have that all inside and they, they do it electronically as well. And just a picture of the electronic mix control. So I want to get into, so that's the, the paver. We want to get into spreader boxes here. So we've got slurry boxes, which are for slurry seal only. They do not have augers, or they may have very small front or dual augers. Uh, again, those are just for slurry seal. They're very lightweight. Um, and the material, I'll show you some photos here, but the material has to be pretty fluid to use a slurry box. Then we have hydraulic spreader boxes for microsurfacing, which are basically fixed. The crew has to stop to change width. And then we have variable width spreader boxes with, with dual augers, and those are for slurry or micro as well. And then we have the rut box. So with the slurry box here, you can see this one has a very small auger in the front, just kind of used to move material. Uh, the, the augers in any slurry box or micro box are not used to mix. They are only there to, to move material. You'll see this is a very lightweight box, and, and it takes a fluid material to make that work. Here's a pretty good shot of a, of a microservicing box, and, and this is not my best photo, but I like a couple things about it. I want to show you one thing, is, as, as both Chuck and, and Debbie talked about, that there's, not any much, there's not any liquids in that material. That's a pretty dry mix, which is what it should be. 
I like that the operator is not keeping a large amount of material in that spreader box. He's keeping it down low. The more material in the spreader box, the more liquids you have to have because that material is in the spreader box longer. And it's, it's always wanting to start to break, set, and cure. And if you've got a spreader box full of material, that means you need more liquids. More liquids usually means not as good a mix. You will see we have, we have some issues here. We have some slight dragging, if you can see that remotely. I hope so. Um, so there's some things that this contractor needed to do, but it's a pretty good shot of that. Here's how, how, we, how the spreader box works. You'll see uh, um, as we, we start this how the augers at the rear of the box, which is at the top of the picture, is the rear. You'll see as the mix goes into the spreader box, the rear augers take it away to keep moving it, and the front augers bring it back. So as that box pulls forward, we don't have a bunch of material slammed up against the back of the spreader box. This material is too wet. I was with the crew that day. They were having some, some material issues. Um, yeah, I was on the verge of probably too wet. But that's what happens. And they made it work. The work looked beautiful. There was no issue with it. But if they would have had to add any more water, it would have been time to stop. Then we talked just about the other, the variable width spreader box, but I wanted to show this close up of the urethane um, secondary strike off. And then there's also another urethane strike off that sits, it's kind of hard to see, but it sits under this rear deck here. Chuck talked about rut filling. Rut filling is very important. Anytime you have ruts that are over a half inch, you need to use a specialized rut box. A rut box normally is either five foot wide or six foot wide. You'll see the angled design of those augers is meant to bring the big rock to the middle of the, to the deeper part of the rut to the middle of the rut and then put just very fine aggregate or sometimes even emulsion only at the edges. So rut box has a lot of controls so that the operator can crown the rut, um, make sure that they're not overlapping. And, and that's definitely needed for, for ruts that are continually over a half inch. Uh, ruts over an inch and a half probably need to have two lifts on them. Quick video here. This will show some adjustments that can be made as a, as a paver pulls forward with the spreader box. They're making adjustments to the secondary to change the texture. Um, I thought they were going to make they can also make some adjustments to raise and lower and change the application rate a little bit. There he goes. So there's a lot of adjustments on that spreader box. It takes the crew a while to learn how to, you know, how to get everything right, but, but there's adjustments there to help you. Support equipment I won't get into. Chuck talked about it. Emulsion pumps, screening plants, front end loaders, all that good stuff. Want to give you a good shot of the mobile support. Again, a mobile support is a lot like the paver. It's got a hopper in the middle. It has a, it has a conveyor belt that moves material into the hopper, and then it has water and emulsion tanks on either side. Uh, it's not very good. It's, you, you do not want a contractor to come out and try and use dump trucks, uh, because what happens is they'll spill material in front of the paver. Unlike hot mix, where a little bit of hot material in front of the paver is not going to be a problem, when you spill raw aggregate in front of that paver, it's always going to be there. It's not going to mix in, and, and you're going to have a delamination as we go forward. So here's some inspection items, very important stuff here. So cleanliness, they need to clean that mixer nightly. If they don't, they go a couple days and don't clean that mixer. It's not going to be as efficient. It's going to change the mix qualities. And it's going to start, you're going to start getting chunks of the old mix coming in through your spreader box. Um, they need to clean the spreader box. Usually, they, on it with a very quick micro, they may have to clean it every time they stop. And they definitely need to clean it nightly. Um, as an inspector, don't always walk clear behind the paver. I like to walk alongside the paver and look underneath. If you see any aggregate falling underneath the paver, You'll get aggregate that falls off the conveyor belt. You'll get aggregate that'll get caught between the conveyor belt and the mixer. Or you'll see aggregate where they, uh, in the, at the front hopper where they're dumping material. If you're seeing any loose aggregate fall on the road, you need to make sure that that contractor stops and fi fi fixes that problem. 
because if you don't, you're going to have a lot of delaminations. Same thing with liquids. Uh, I've seen pavers run down a road with 10 buckets underneath them, and that's not a good thing. We, don't, we need to stop the leaks, not catch the leaks. Spreader box, same thing. It needs to be clean. We want our augers as low as we can to the road with, without hitting the road. The reason for that is the lower they are, the better they move that mix, the better the mix works, and the quicker they can get it out of the spreader box. We, we don't want the augers foaming. We don't want them really mixing material. They just need to be a, a, a not gentle, but they, they, you just don't want to see a lot of material splashing. Um, I used to tell my crews, if I'm wearing khakis and I can't walk across your catwalk without getting dirty, you're moving your augers too fast. Make sure their front rubber's in place. That keeps all the material in the spreader box. You'll know if the front rubber's not working if you see a, a if you see a slurry seal or microsurfacing racing in front of the spreader box. And when they go downhill, sometimes it'll really move out. So you'll be able to see that. You'll you'll catch that. Make sure in your slurry box your side rubbers are in place, or on a heavy box your runners your side runners are in place and not rocking and that the urethane is tight with no wrinkles. A slurry or microsurfacing paver must be calibrated to make sure that the mix produced by the paver matches the mix design. It must be calibrated using the aggregate that you're going to use on the project and the emulsion type that you're going to be used on the project. It must be recalibrated if you have a material change, if, you, if the contractor repairs or replaces a, an emulsion pump, or if they repair or replace conveyor skirt board rudder, rubbers or any part of the mixer. I think that emulsions should be calibrated for every job uh, or at least once per month if you're on a very long job because that's an important part of the mix and, and you don't want a machine to go out of calibration. So again, that calibration, paver calibration, converts that volumetric batch mix design into a continuous feed process. The aggregate and emulsion are mechanically or electronically connected to maintain mix design ratios. In most pavers, which in, in mechanical pavers, the emulsion rate is fixed and the aggregate is adjusted by raising or lowering the gate. So what is calibration? Calibration is a process of measuring by weight aggregate, emulsion, mineral filler, and correlating that weight to revolutions of a counter that is, is checking to, to know how many revolutions we have on the aggregate belt. So, you're, so your goal is to get weight per count. So you get weight per count of aggregate, and then weight per count of emulsion, and weight per count of mineral filler, and you're able then to decide how to set the machine to meet your mix design. So we talk about deviations. I'm not going to go far into this right now, but uh, we need to make sure that our, our each individual calibration does not exceed 2%. If you do, you need to rerun that trial. Uh, scales, we can use a platform scale. They can use a, or excuse me, a, a big truck scale. They can use a small platform scale. Again, it just needs to be um, something that's accurate and, and easy to use for the crew. So again, why do we calibrate? We're setting the paver so the ratios of material stay in line with the mix design. We're ensuring quality control of the system for the contractor and the buyer agency, and where it's a basis for, for recording the amount of materials used. So that's why it's important. So again, if we were just making this material in a batch, it would be very simple. We would have 100 pounds of dry rock. We would want 10% emulsion. We would take 10 pounds of emulsion, dump it in that rock, mix it up, lay it on the road, and go do it again. If we wanted 12% emulsion, we'd have 100 pounds of dry rock. We'd dump in 12% of emulsion, mix it up, lay it on the road, and do it again. We can't do that. Again, we are a continuous paving operation. So we talk about, again, how we have the the aggregate and the emulsion tied together, delivering a consistent amount of aggregate into the mixer with a consistent amount of, of uh, emulsion. So at the end of the slurry paver, at the rear of the slurry paver, on mechanical pavers, 
we have an adjustable gate that can be adjusted up or down to increase or decrease the amount of aggregate going in per revolution of the pulley. That fixed outlet area provides a consistent volume of material and all you need to do is to calibrate is you count the number of revolutions, you weigh the amount of aggregate that, w that came through that number of revolutions and you get a pound per count or weight per count, excuse me. And they, there we're weighing a truck on a, on a uh, truck scale. Emulsion calibration is very similar. Emulsion pumps, normally we're running gear pumps, and I give a demonstration of that in a second. But a gear pump gives a positive displacement. It's positive displacement. So we have a fixed volume, which is also a fixed weight of emulsion every time that pump turns. So we know every time this emulsion pump turns, you get what, about 4.8 pounds. Is that what your emulsion pumps run, guys? So you get roughly 4.8 pounds of emulsion every time you get a turn of that belt. There's also variable displacement pumps, and we're not going to get too far into that. So just a quick shot of a gear pump. You'll see those gears, each time they turn, they grab a known amount of emulsion and push it out the outlet port. Every turn, same thing. Every turn, same thing. Doesn't matter if the pump's running, I don't know, 400 RPM or it's running 40 RPM. Every revolution, same amount of material. So again, to recalibrate it, we, we, pump, we pump material into a vessel to weigh it. We count the revolutions. We know that we, we got 400 pounds of emulsion divided by 40 counts, and we can get a pounds of emulsion per count. Again, just another shot of the, of the jack shaft. A little bit better than the other picture. Emulsion pump tied to, there's a, to the shaft of the uh, conveyor belt. They're all tied together and the ratios work. So this is how we take care we adjust the aggregate gate. And remember I told you that to adjust emulsion percent, we're changing the rock. It gets a little confusing. In this point, we have a four inch gate setting. So that equals each turn of the rock gives us um, 100 pounds of, of aggregate. The emulsion comes out for each turn at 10 pounds. So with a four inch gate, we've got a 10% mix design. With this, is if, if we change that mix gate to a 3.3 inch mix design, that means every turn gives us 83.3 pounds of rock and um, Every turn also continually st continues to give us 10 pounds of emulsion. So 10 pounds over 83.3, we get 12% mixed design. So that's why raising and lowering the gate changes our emulsion percentage, even though the emulsion is fixed. I talk about the counters. You'll see on the lower end of the photo, there's a, a mechanical type counter. Most of those are hopefully out of existence. And you'll also see uh, electronic counters now. They all work the same way. They take a pulse off the, uh, off the, the uh, shaft and, and count the revolutions. So again, it doesn't matter what, how fast it's turning, one count is one count. If the paver's moving slow, it's the same weight per count as if the paver's moving extremely fast. There's another shot of the uh, a gate that can be raised and lowered. Lower the gate to increase the emulsion percent raise the great gate to decrease the emulsion percent. Um, we're not going to go into calibration today. We are going to go into it and have a video later. So let me grab a couple of slides out of here. Um, Debbie talked about the bulking effect. I think with between what she explained and what I just showed you about the gate is if an aggregate bulks up quite a bit when you add moisture, it's going to change uh, how it's going to go through that gate, and you just need to make settings for it. And one more. So, in conclusion, slurry pavers are simple, kind of, but they're also kind of complicated. Calibration is vital. If, you're, if, if you ask your contractor, if you're the inspector and you go, hey, when did you calibrate this thing? And they scratch their head and they can't give you an answer, it's time to calibrate the paver, okay? Truck mount and continuous pavers do the same thing, only different, and cleanliness of the paver matters.